Hello and welcome to another edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. Today we turn our attention yet again uh, to Bill C-18. This is uh, the second of three bills in which the government in one way or another is attempting to regulate the internet. Uh, this one is about imposing a tax, if you will, on social media companies to subsidize legacy media and even some of the, the new media out there. And some of the critics have put it this way, that forcing social media to subsidize news organizations news organizations makes no more sense than forcing Amazon to subsidize the Bay. So the question is, will it actually achieve uh, any of the goals of more open and trusted media? Not likely. In fact, there are uh, probably going to be fewer sources of information available to the public, but lots of issues around this. At the Senate, we've been taking all sorts of testimony, and we heard recently from Peter Menzies, who is a former vice chair of the CRTC and worked for 16 years as publisher and editor-in-chief at the Calgary Herald. So we'll talk to him a little bit later on about the impact of this bill on access to information and whether it compromises the independence of the media. But we begin today with Mr. Conrad von Finkenstein. Now, he's a former judge the former chair of the CRTC, a public servant for many years. He dealt with issues of trade, competition, communication law. He was commissioner of the Competition um, uh, Bureau of Canada and many, many other jobs. So he has testified a couple of times on these issues. We have found him today floating on the Indian Ocean off the shores of Oman. Are you... Are you there? <laughs> I, I am here. I'm indeed floating on the ocean. <laughs> I'm sure all of these thoughts are not first and foremost in your mind as you look at a part of the world that I'm sure is breathtaking. Yeah, that's that's true. But unfortunately, through the internet, you know, I can follow everything that's going on. And so, <laughs> so I... I, I it is not out of my mind at all. All right. Well, let's let's jump into it. We're getting ever closer to this bill becoming law. When you testified uh, in front of uh, the Senate a little while back, um, you you just said that uh, well, a couple of very interesting things that that the CRTC might not be ready to take on the regulatory role. It's an organization that had regulated broadcast, not print media. Um, that we have to consider the implications of the big tech companies even gathering more data than they have access to if they are instructed to have these um, relationships, direct financial relationships with news organizations. So tell us a little bit with some distance what you think the main issues are. Well, I I've <clears throat> find the whole concept it's very strange, and I don't quite understand why the government has chosen this way. They clearly are worried about not having good news or making sure that Canadians get objective uh, uh, professional news. And the way they have chosen is, is using the uh, uh, version of the Australian system by saying the Google and the Facebook Called, uh, called digital news intermediaries and anybody else who does the same thing should pay when they link with uh, traditional newspapers, newsmakers. Now, first of all, I don't understand the concept because the linking is done not only by Google and Facebook, but also by the newspapers. They they get they link with social media. That's where they get their clients from, etc. And so it's a very questionable assumption that in effect, uh, Google uh, earns more than the newsmakers out of the out of, out of the, through the linking. But even if so, they are supposed to negotiate it. But it nowhere does it spell out in the uh, in the act what are they supposed to negotiate. And what they are actually negotiating is not the linking. The linking is not. It is the value that uh, Google or Facebook or all of these people. Uh, get from the data that they obtain. They get masses of data from people who 
would link, who want to find out, go on Google and then link with, uh, with uh, let's say, the Toronto Star or whatever. That data they managed to uh, to curate and then sell to advertisers. And that's, makes the, that's where the money is. And of course, the newsmakers are missing the, their income from advertising. So what right. you're really trying to say is negotiate about what value does Google get out of the data that it opposes when it uh, it, 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 it obtains when it la- links is, is with newsmakers mm-hmm. and is used by general uh, by Canadians. That's a very difficult thing to f- do. Well, and it's no way is spelled out, and I have no. The the irony so of it all is that. Uh, as we've heard from so many of even the legacy media players, they wouldn't even be alive if the social media platforms weren't republishing their material. It's actually giving them access to way more yeah. eyeballs. Exactly. So, so it's based on the wrong premise. What you are really trying to do is what is the, the data that Google obtains or Facebook obtains, what is the value of that data and to what extent should it be shared with the newspapers because some of that data they obtain by people linking with newspapers via via Google or Facebook. That's really what it's all about. But it's not, uh, no, if you really wanted to, well, let's go back to basics. What is this all about? This is really about supporting journalism, decent journalism in Canada. I'm sure that Google and Facebook, et cetera, would have no problem compensating if you set up a compensation fund or something. But no, you've set up this arbitrary, arbitrary, uh, mandatory negotiation with mandatory arbitration at the end if you can't react about something that's not spelled out. Nobody quite knows it. The deals will not be made public, and the deals will be different with different uh, newsmakers. So, uh, frankly, I I find it incredible that we that we at this stage that this concept was put put forward, and that uh, uh, we have well, it's long, passed the House of Commons and may be enacted. I yeah, it's, I mean, it's really if you wanted possible. to, do, you, could, you could say, let's go, go uh, the. Uh, we're de- de- dealing uh, here with the tax. So if you want to p- pull a tax on links, yeah, fine. But then why are these links and not other links? Right. Or else you could do thing, saying this whole thing is really not a negotiation at, at all. It is all has to do with copyright. Let's amend the Copyright Act and put right. in a tariff for snippets. And then, then pay, put an orderly thing concept in place but it hasn't been done yet yeah the the big play i mean the big social media platforms are already saying that a they say they follow uh the copyright laws as it is and if they're not let them know b to your other point they have certainly said if you want us to contribute to a support the media fund we'll do that but this is such a cumbersome way to do it and from the government's point of view, it, it, it seems even there's a double irony here because they're actually making the big tech companies more powerful. It gives them more tools and more information when they're actually trying to, they say, preserve the uh, the traditional media. In fact, they're creating the monsters they say they don't want. No, but not only that, but they are, they're forcing them to control the newsmakers, that they live up to certain objectives which are spelled out in the act. So, in effect, the digital uh, platforms are going to control what the newsmakers uh, put out. I mean, this is it's contrary to freedom of speech, uh, but, you know, completely the opposite. You're putting the giants in charge of the, of the, of the of their critics. No, it's... Um... I, uh, it's very troubling because, in fact, that is, I think, going to be the result, which there'll be fewer sources. We've already seen a couple of the big players say they're just simply going to shut down uh, their carriage of Canadian news. That That's how they'll deal with this. They just it's a, it's a small part of their business model. So why bother with all this complicated process? Well, yeah. And the CRDC has lots of 
experience dealing with broadcasting and, and right. with telecom, but absolutely none was dealing with, with newspapers. And yet here, here the, and all are the expert in supervising and guiding arbitrations. And yet that's what their job is going to be here. Supposedly it's be hands off, you negotiate, but anything goes sideways. We are there to step in and, and repair the process. I not, don't think the CRTC has, has, the, has the courses to do that right now. And then, as I mentioned, when I testified to you, there's this whole issue of uh, of discrimination and disadvantage and preference that, in effect, anybody, any newspaper can complain and say, look, I was picked up by, by, by Google, but I was ranked improperly. I was ranked seventh and should have been first because my story is the most valuable one people want. And if they make such a claim and they succeed, then there are big damages to be paid, and the end. On top of it, Google has the has the burden of proof of showing that the complaint is wrong. It's a reverse onus. It's specifically put in there. You know, if you speak to uh, the uh, the digital news intermediary, they say this is an unacceptable risk. I mean, we make thousands, millions of these decisions with artificial intelligence, and now you want us to be able to justify that each decision is not discriminatory, not disadvantaged, or not to the un it didn't uh, disprefer? Uh, makes no sense. Well, that is part of the problem with, with taxing the links, because um, as you say, it's all done with algorithms, and you know what comes up on my uh, feed my Google feeds, or it will be different than what comes up on yours because of our particular interests. And what we add to that, or what other people add to that, we're now making the big companies liable when they have no part of the process at all. I, I agree with you absolutely. Now, the it's interesting, CRTC has very broad powers of exemptions, and right. they can exempt companies that have deals that comply with a whole host of of conditions which really have nothing to do with business. They have to do with uh, with national policies for, for newspapers, you know, trying to make sure the regional stories are picked up, that indigenous news is being picked up, that's presented fairly, etc. I mean, the only thing I can say that to make this workable is to use that exemption power and say, here, we have, Newsmaker, if you make it, a, 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 if you create a fund and make people pay into it and pay into that fund, and then newsmakers are entitled to go into that fund on a, a very simple basis, X dollar, let's say per uh, journalist employed, etc. So you know, you could work something like out like that, but the act wasn't designed that way at all. It would be a very According to CRTC, who tried to squeeze that into the exemption power, which which is very broad and unlimited, but was not meant for that purpose at all. Well, the other thing is, and we heard, that from, is, we heard from the newspapers themselves yeah. that uh, one, and this was uh, a, a bit ironic as well, that they're they're actually paying some of the big. Um, uh, platforms to carry their news and their content to promote it. But secondly, they also then don't want the government through the CRTC or the platforms coming in and knowing their financial business in a detailed way because they say that's proprietorial information. I think we've lost you there for a minute. So no, no, we both agree that I mean this whole act is and it won't achieve the purpose that it's designed for. Yeah, I'm really astounded that it's still going forward. But it also will be contested. I mean, you can be sure it will be right. contested on the basis of uh, free speech. I have no doubt about it. There will be also a question of in terms of constitutionality. What uh, what uh, power does the federal government have to direct? And newspapers to have to, or, or the digital news intermediaries to have to negotiate with newspapers. I don't think there's, 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 I find that hard to find a federal power under which you could squeeze this, etc. So it may, I think we will, it be a long time before this act actually sees the light of day in terms of being implemented. You know, there, was, there will be those challenges for sure. Yeah. 
No, definitely on free speech, constitutionality. The other area of your expertise, of course, is is trade. And this came up with uh, with Bill C ten and C eleven, uh, its its successor, and now this one, which is: Can you regulate foreign companies operating on your soil? Can you try and regulate an international? Um, operation like the internet. It, this is it, the internet doesn't somehow live inside Canadian borders and then go and live inside U.S. borders. This is a, a global phenomenon. Yeah, but the Act does not uh, prefer Canadian uh, uh, news intermediary to to foreign ones. I mean, there there happen to be all foreign ones, but if there was a Canadian. Google would apply to it as well. So I, right. I think in terms of trade, uh, is enforceability is another one. You know, how right. do you enforce it? You, in effect, right. you have have to say that, that Google, you, you, unless you have these uh, agreements negotiated and in place, you, we will prohibit Canadian. ISPs to carry your your messages. That's the only way you can do it. You basically have to block them. And I don't know how else you're going to enforce it. If if they play high, hardball and say, no, we're not going to play by this. So we are not located in Canada. And, you know, people want to use our website, uh, our platform and link. That's absolutely, I will, we, re, we refuse to comply then you're going to be pushed into having to block them, which is going to be very unpopular, as you can imagine. So, so well, I, it, I, I see. Yeah, no, I think that it's it's making the system. I mean, what we saw uh, happen in Australia, really, and everybody says the Australian model, but in fact what happened is the Australian government sort of looked at all those questions that you've just raised and, and kind of backed away. And say go and go and negotiate, but other than that, we're going to kind of stay out of it. Well, they created a sort of democracy. They said, "Here's this bill; it, we can make it apply yeah. to you, but since you've made deals, we won't." So the yeah. bill is basically just says as said. Yeah, and uh, so, so to, uh, nobody yet knows whether it would actually work if the if the uh, Australians would implement it. But I, it's also the, they are not going as far as this act goes uh, in terms of who is covered by it and who, who has to comp uh, comply and who can benefit. All of these questions, as you know, under the act are very open, are open and the definition of beneficiaries is so wide it brings in people that, who really have nothing to do with the news business. Well, and they're also kind of undermining the whole the whole new world that is generated news organizations that operate strictly online and based on subscriptions that don't want government money that don't want money from the the social media platforms they just want uh, of course they need them uh, to distribute their content but they 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 say let us be that we we've got this platform to operate on it's all working yeah I I, and you've heard lots of testimony in the in the last few from those people who are saying you're going to destroy our business because you are basically destroy our ability to find new customers and have our new business cases built on a digital world and you're trying to de destroy it in order to ke keep alive the, the pre digital world. You know, it's it's. it's uh, I, I mean. I, you have a very tough job uh, ahead of you, but I hope you manage to, to, to change some provisions of the act to at least make it a little less painful than it is right now. <laughs> That's a very good word. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, really a pleasure uh, talking with you today, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt your your vacation, but it was great to to have your contribution here. <laughs> Carry on with, uh, You're with welcome. Your, your cruise. Conrad von Good Finger, luck. <laughs> a former judge. He was, of course, for many years the chairman of the CRTC, so he knows what he's talking about when he says the CRTC is not probably up for this job and has followed this issue very, very carefully as a, as a judge and a very sharp legal mind. Uh, thanks again. We'll, we'll talk again, Thank I'm you. sure, on this very bill.
All right. And now, as promised, we turn to Peter Menzies. Now, Peter, you are on solid ground, I hope, in Calgary and not floating around on the ocean like Conrad. I am not floating on the ocean. No, <laughs> and I'm not we're, even floating on a river today. So. We're so jealous. Peter Menzies, as I said earlier, of course, is a former vice chair of the CRTC, and he also worked in the newspaper industry 16 years at the Calgary Herald as publisher and editor in chief. So he too knows what he's talking about when it comes uh, to this issue of Bill C 18. You know, it really gives me pause when a mind like Conrad's says this bill is ill-conceived, it threatens free speech, and will probably end up in court for years. What are we doing? No reason to distrust Conrad's judgment on that. <laughs> this uh, this whole bill just seems to be coming right off the rails. Actually, it it uh, I watched the the Senate hearings yesterday. And I, I found it really interesting that, I mean, nobody there wanted the bill passed as is. Right. Not even News Media Canada. I mean, those guys were giving up their front pages to campaign for this for years. There were, you know, there, there you haven't seen any op-eds criticizing it and right. that sort of stuff. And it actually kind of shows why maybe we should have been open to a bit more criticism of this bill early on. And yeah. then we wouldn't have to have guys, guys like Paul Deegan wouldn't have to be there at this late stage in front of the Senate asking for amendments, right? Yeah. That the, this could have been shaped to what they really wanted, which Philip Crawley, you know, tried to explain. All we're looking for is to make sure there's a, an imbalance in in, uh, in power here to be addressed. And we want to be able to make fair deals with these guys. Yeah. Well, that's not an illegitimate aspiration. No. And that is maybe a proper role for government, maybe competition bureaus, although Canada's competition law is a little iffy. Yeah. But to put some pressure on for that. But Bill C-18 is none of that. It's just pain. It just is, you know, when we watch the two worlds and we see this at, at a lot of our hearings. So you've got the, the new... Uh, digital, the online news operations like The Line or Canada Land or whatever it is, they're saying we don't want government money, we don't want corporate money, we just want to live in this new world that everybody promised us was going to exist, that we would do things online. And then you've got the more, the traditional, the legacy world sitting there going, we need the money because they're they're taking our ads, but we don't want them to have any say over what we do. Like, it was a real contrast in where these the two worlds of journalism live. Yeah, I mean there were there were actually almost three worlds there, weren't there? There was there was the world of 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 the new, the innovative, the entrepreneurs, right, who are trying yeah. to figure out a way to make the the digital to make Facebook and Google work for them. Yeah, in that in that, in that sense, um, you know, the, the, uh, Jesse and and Jen and. Uh, and 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 uh, village media, Jeff. Yep. There, I mean, none of what they're doing says indicates that there has been a market failure, as Paul, Paul Deegan pointed out from News right. Media Canada. In terms of that, in fact, if anything, it's proof that the market is working. Right. That the people who are innovative and who are adapting are are finding success, albeit at a fairly modest level. I, I'm guessing, but. The people who aren't being innovative and aren't adapting are not finding success. To me, that's that's the market working. There's there's no market failure in right. in, in in terms of that objective. But there is also so there's a, the failure to adapt. There's the ones who are exploring new ways of adaptation. And then I thought there was like the Globe and Mail, right? Who uh, Philip Crawley articulated that very well. Like twenty years ago, seventy percent of their revenue was 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 advertising, print advertising. And 30% of it was subscription sales, right? To either home delivery or single copy sales and yep. that sort of stuff, which was a typical newspaper model. But because they went with the subscription model and the paywall and they maintained an investment in quality content, right? Which is key. I mean, it's not yep. like they haven't trimmed down. They have. But they maintained a focus on producing quality content. They now have 70% of rib. They have 330,000 subscribers, which, which he mentioned, which is yep. a lot. Yep. And most of those are it's digital. 
and they are willing to pay for quality content. And there's examples like that around the world. The Wall Street Journal, the Daily Telegraph. Daily Telegraph is making buckets of cash these yeah, days. Guardian, yeah. Guardian, I mean, the Guardian's even volu voluntary. Yeah. But yeah, so C18, and the, the, the sad thing is C18 isn't going to fix anything for anybody. No, but it's, it's going to complicate to everybody's life. Yes, and and as and as I thought Jesse and 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 others pointed out, and you know, and and the, to be fair to you know, like News Media Canada and others, everybody there, La Presse, Le Devoir, they were all concerned about how this is going to impact their image and their relationship with the public, well, which was really refreshing to hear. Yeah, uh, I mean, Conrad was just mentioning it a moment ago too that this, you know, that this impacts free speech and and the freedom of speech right not only just because the the big social platforms might pull out or stop carrying news in response to the government's um uh legislation but that it just it limits debate because if you're dependent on people you might tend to self censor and and Jen Gerson conceded that yesterday, that if you're dependent on somebody for cash, as you say, you don't see the editorials denouncing it on the front page because you don't bite the hand that feeds. Yeah. And I mean, you everybody does that in media. Everybody is conscious of the hand that feeds, right? Yeah. The best way is to be, is for, if the hand that is feeding is your reader, right? <laughs> Correct. That's, that's the best way to be independent. I mean, Gerson's the line is an example. Like I'm a subscriber there, and I write yeah. for them occasionally. And and they uh, uh, um, early on, Jen used to like to use some fairly salty language, right? Um, from time to time in her writing, and then they toned it down. Yeah, and they changed it. They self censored, so to speak, because they got pushback from their readers. Kind yeah. of like really, you know, this and friendly, you know, the usual sort of friendly banter you might get from readers, but. You know that that would say, "Hey, I really enjoy your stuff, but you know, I want my kids to be able to read it. Um, that sort yeah. of stuff. That I don't want it to be adults only." And you kind of go, "Oh, okay. I guess I probably I can say freak, right? Um, yeah. I, I don't need to use the that 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 language as you know as as saucy and fun and sort of edgy as it might appear. Eventually, you just sort of self censor. So, but if it's becoming Facebook and Google that you're looking over your shoulder at. That's a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah. Right. Because of all the stuff that's going on, all the issues we're facing in society going forward. I mean, the AI thing is just coming up right now. Probably exactly. mentioned yesterday that this whole search thing and links six months from now, I mean, Bill C-18 is built around paying for links. Yeah. Two months from now, there might not be any links. I mean, I was thinking even just last <laughs> month, I was thinking five years from now. And now you're hearing people say, in a year. Next year. Yeah. Yeah. And all I mean, I'll add with AI and all that's getting there's a lot of issues there that we should be dealing with. Well, the this bill doesn't even contemplate. I mean, I think that's part of the problem. And and you and I come out of the journalism industry, so we have an unfair advantage in the sense of we actually understand how it operates. You know, the things you talk about when you're when your readers or your viewers in in my case for many years, you know, have a comment, you react to that. That's different than the advertiser saying, if you say a critical word about my company, we're pulling all the ads. You know, that's a different kind of censorship. And and it yeah, makes me concerned when we've now got the CRTC, uh, the big tech companies, the advertisers all looking over everybody's shoulder because they're so dependent on the money. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as, as almost everybody said yesterday, having the CRTC snooping around in your newsroom right. isn't really the best idea. You know, like, And that's where it comes back to, the, I mean, the, the, the 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 crux of C eighteen is that it's a really poorly constructed piece of legislation, right? Yeah. As much as some of us might believe that there's really no economic rationale behind it, right. um, even even if you accept that, it's just a poorly crafted piece of piece of legislation where there's there's no need for the CRTC to be snooping around in this. There's no public money involved, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if this is truly a commercial arrangement, which 
you know, okay, let's run yeah. with that for a, a bit. Forced commercial right? arrangement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a shotgun wedding. If they, yes, if for sure. Saw one, right? um, but, 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 but it's a sort of forced commercial arrangement. But if it was truly a commercial arrangement, the government or a government agency has, absolutely, has no business poking right. its nose around in there, right? I mean, they, that's that's not the right and proper role for government. Governments don't, you know, stick their noses into 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 commercial contracts and that sort of stuff. Somebody wants to make a deal with somebody, they make a deal with somebody. I mean, yeah, it's got to be legal, but you know that. But 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 that's the end of it. But they can't resist. <laughs> so much problem with government is so often they want to help. Yes. We're from the government. We're here to help. Oh, no. Yes. Oh, yeah, no. We're from Ottawa and we're here yeah. to help. And, <laughs> and it's, oh, my. Um, that's okay. And that's where you hear from the others, like uh, like Jesse from Canada Land. What do we really want? And, I mean, guys like Western Standard, I think, will probably have either have or will be appearing before. Yeah, they have. Yeah. I mean, say the same sort of thing. Right. Just leave us alone. What do we yeah. really want? Just leave us alone. Get out of our way. Right? And, and let us and deal because, with our readers or our listeners, and that—that's their audience. That's the relationship. Well, yeah, and for folks like Blacklocks, who long ago made what turned out to be the right play on having a paywall, yeah, right. That we will produce trusted content. Our only, re our only relationship, really, apart, you know, it will be with our subscribers, yeah. our readers, and we will try to produce content that will be. I mean, they were the same operation during the Harper government as they are during the Trudeau yeah. government, um, just trying to do straight news. And and more, I mean, Western Standard has a very strong bias in its commentary, uh, pro-conservative, and in its choice of news. But when it does its news stories, it tries to play them straight. Yeah. As people, you know, and Epoch Times does that too, like in... And I mean, I read a Toronto Star piece yesterday, to be fair to them, that was coverage of yesterday's events and i read it after yesterday's hearings and i read it after i watched the hearing and i thought well this is a this is a very good unbiased you know news yeah, report that's what people point. want yeah and that's what people will pay for well that was the really i i found it interesting that jesse brown from canada land just decided to lead with this his whole discussion was about trust in media and how mm -hmm. that has broken down for a whole lot of reasons because there it's been harder and harder to distinguish between opinion and news um, on the CBC and in the news pages of papers and everywhere else. So people are starting and because they have a lot more sources now, they can they can kind of compare and contrast. But he really put his emphasis on that. This this the the media relationship is broken and this is going to further crack the system, not help heal. Yeah, yeah. And it really comes into, and this has been quite a bit in the news lately, this whole idea of, you know, conflict of interest, right? Yeah. Um, I remember years ago, we were creating a an internal ethics and conflict of interest guideline for the newsroom at the Calgary Herald. And and it was largely we we're, were having the staff sort of create it themselves, right? They turned it over and they would come back at a certain point and say, okay, this is as far as we got with this one. We think management needs to make the call on this, right? Which is which was fine. But I remember talking to a few people who were resisting some of the the, uh, uh, the conflict of interest thing, and they were like, wait a second, wait a second. I know when I'm in a conflict of interest. <laughs> it's kind of like, no, you don't. It's, right? yes. it's the whole point of it, right? The whole point of it, and, you know, David Johnston might not think he's in a conflict right. of interest, and he might not be in a legal conflict of interest, but it's how you are perceived. If conflict of interest is perceived, and so for newspapers and, and, and news media, no matter how righteous you might believe you are when, and, and unimpeded, by uh, by your you know dependence on a piece of government legislation and money from from web giants um, in the sort of bond villain world we live yeah. in right the, 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 these days it doesn't matter what you think yeah. what matters is what the person who is consuming your product thinks or fears or suspects yeah. right you got to get rid of all that stuff because the only that's the only way you succeed in 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 media is by maintaining public trust. 
And but frankly, it's the, it's the only way you attract advertisers. In my experience, exactly. advertisers were attracted to your product because people trusted it. Right. And even if sometimes they were offended by by you, they they would mo the the vast majority would stick with it because they knew that it was the trust in which the, the trust that people had in you made them trust their advertising too. right and reflect they well trusted, on that's that, that, that's right they trusted that that the newspaper that they trusted would not allow some scam advertising in, inside yeah. its pages. No, and that whole relationship is uh, has broken down too, obviously. I mean, people are looking for eyeballs, and so they'll go where they are, and, and that's what the internet is about. I mean, it, it has um, changed the relationship, but it's not, I mean, it was interesting, some statistics that, that we heard in testimony, but also from other reports is the ad dollars are still out there. I mean, they're, 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 st they're just coming in a different form and they want more options. It's not like they've disappeared. Oh, no, no. There's, I mean, there's there many people are advertising. People are still trying to attract people to their products. I mean, in, yeah. in, in the, in the uh, hearing yesterday, the, the guy spoke about how much they are paying to Facebook. Right? Yes. So, I well, mean, I think that one shocked. Like, let's just stop for a moment because that that took a lot of people by surprise. But newspapers have been doing those arrangements with each other over the years, whether it's a Bloomberg News or something, you know, and you sure. do exchange of product because everybody's getting more exposure in a different window. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I mean, how? I mean, one of the things that, that Facebook and, and and online advertising offers is is this ability to target people, right? So, for instance, you know, there's there's this an election in Alberta last week, right? If you lived in certain ridings, if you lived in a safe NDP riding in Edmonton, you probably saw not a heck of a lot of NDP advertising because they didn't need to waste their money advertising in, uh, right. You know, if you're in Rachel Notley's writing, right? I mean, right, she's right. got that in the bag. There's, there's, there's no worry there. And you probably didn't see many UCP ads either, right? Because yeah. these days everybody can focus, they can direct the advertising so locally that you get that. So for the case of a of a newspaper wanting to advertise on Facebook, right, they're going to look for, they're going to spend the money to have Facebook find them the audience they are looking they for. Want, absolutely. For this story, which happens to be about, I don't know, a, a new Canadian film. So seek, yep. find me people who are interested in Canadian film and, and I will pay you to, to seek them out for us. Right. We and, were, and that's, that's the way it goes. We were having a, a similar conversation with Alan Gregg recently on the podcast about pollsters. And he's, you know, that's exactly what they're doing. He said, if you want, you know, single mothers whose children are taking dance lessons, um, you know, between four and six, we can yep. find you that target group. Yep. You can talk to them, right? Yep. yep. So and, and that's, and, and that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons, that's something that newspapers could never do. Yeah. Right. I mean, Newspapers used to, and, and for all I know, still do if they still have much flyer business left. And I think they have some still some flyer business. You used to be able to break down your flyer deliveries in terms of which right. neighborhood and that sort of stuff. Somebody might just want a, a liquor store in, you know, southeast Edmonton or northwest Calgary or, you know, Harbor Landing in Regina might yeah. just want to advertise to that neighborhood and you could do that. But nothing like the efficiency that that uh, Facebook was able to bring with targeted advertising. Uh, broadcasters can do it too because they know what you're watching on cable. Yeah. Um, they don't know what you are personally watching, but if, uh, but they know what the home is watching. And that's what, what home, Conrad was talking about too, is that this whole thing is really about uh, data gathering and and data searching for the big uh, social media companies. So this whole thing is that we're making big bag tech pay is kind of silly because you're making big tech more important, more powerful than they've ever been through this legislation. 
Yeah, and it, it, that's one of the, I mean, really troubling problems with this whole thing is is that you would be entrenching their power. Yeah. Right. I mean, th- there are real issues around big tech. You know, sort of in in opposing Bill C eighteen, it's easy for those in favor of it to sort of try to paint people like me as being, you know, big tech. Um, love child. empathizers uh, yeah, yeah, empath- <laughs> yeah yeah exactly or defender yeah. um but there are other things going on like market dominance which i think is you know crawley mentioned that yesterday it's a legitimate yeah. issue um you can't ignore the legitimate issues in there but you know algorithm use and that sort of stuff like we're yeah. just talking about it you know like you know it, you know, and, the, and as Conrad's right, the money is in the data collection. So if okay. if there is a financial benefit for for Facebook in this, and I think there's probably more of one for for Google, it's in the yeah. the data that they can collect through 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 the through the subscribers. But you know, issues you know like algorithms that that you know give us this value, those are an issue too because they're sure they get you what you want, but you kind of can be building your own prison wall with it. Yeah, exactly. Right? You can be entombing yourself in a self-reinforcing, uh, you know, spot where all of a sudden all the feeds you get are from, you know, things you agree with. Yeah, and I don't think that's I don't think that's good for any of us. No, that I, is I, not good, and it is one of the knocks on on you know algorithms choosing and feeding back to us. It's absolutely true. We end up in our own little echo chambers, but that is not resolved by having fewer and fewer inputs into the internet world. Like we need more sources of information, not less. Exactly, exactly. Reinforcing the you know. Uh, duopoly or oligopoly yeah. or uh, status of, of Facebook and that sort of stuff isn't going to help. I mean, yeah. I actually think, <laughs> I mean, as 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 devastating as this would be for people like Jeff LG, I would be hope if Facebook walks, and they will if Bill C-18 yeah. uh, passes, I'm convinced of that um, from this. In a sense, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to see people like Jeff LG be able to figure something out so they could survive and i and and i hopefully facebook would be reasonable in some sense or another but they can't pick and choose i guess um in a sense it it it, it's it's not a bad thing because it 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 recognizes that facebook shouldn't be the sole supplier of everything to you right that there should be other places where you go and that you know if if you want to read the national post or the Saskatoon Star Phoenix download the app. Yeah, right? it's no big deal, you know, to to do that. And I think people who want news will be able to find news just fine. I've got two other issues. I I just are topics that I just want to hear you on. So one is what I think is the sleeper issue here: that if the CBC really is the major beneficiary of this, there's going to be uh, some serious backlash. They already get. billion dollars and if they start getting big payments from uh from big tech through this i think there's going to be a fight but but before we get there it's just the larger question when when we were talking about bill c11 same kind of issues what is government doing in this business why are we saying you need to watch more canadian content on an international platform a global platform why are we putting small people that are earning their living on google or or, um, tiktok or someplace being really creative we're having the discussion here why are we killing these creative communities whether in the news business or the entertainment business in favor of a lot of legacy models that aren't really functioning like what is the government's intent what are they trying to accomplish i mean we've had some suggestions from ministers like stephen gilbo that you know the government doesn't really want to hear criticism about itself i mean he was sort of shut up on that front because i think they saw how dangerous it was but what are they trying to do they're trying to recreate the world they're trying to it's always they're trying to recreate 1989 near as i can figure out right I, I find it remarkable that Why? these are these are very regressive actions from yeah. a government that prides itself on being progressive. Right? Yeah. I, I think industrially, 
you know, so maybe that, that's socially, but industrially, they seem to be extremely regressive. You know, they started off with an innovation agenda, which sounded like a great idea, right? Yeah. That was, you know, sort of very positive. We're going to inspire innovation and that sort of stuff. And everything they've done has been to suppress it, right? Whether it's in the oil and gas industry where yeah. people have been innovative in coming up with new ways to reduce emissions and what they get in response is, uh, yeah, yeah, you're Not still enough. in the oil business, yeah. right? You know, like, what are you? <laughs> and then, and then the, you know, with, with Bill, Bill C-11, the broadcast industry, I mean, just the fact that you're re, you know, you're, you're modernizing the broadcasting act. <laughs> to deal with the internet just displays a mentality yeah you know and 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 ian scott bless his soul that you know the former crtc chairman yeah. was appearing before committees and saying oh we've been doing this for you know 30 40 years this will be no you haven't no you haven't this is, no you haven't right like, this is a whole new thing right and and with the big disappointment there is you know it's not so much that they're controlling streaming services and trying to promote Canadian content and that sort of stuff. Those are virtuous things, right? I mean, you shouldn't be able to come in this country, start a business, take a billion dollars a year out of it and leave nothing behind. Right. Nobody would let that happen. Yeah, they wouldn't okay. let automakers do that. They wouldn't let oil companies do it. There's no reason why you'd let TV companies do it, right? But as long as you're, it doesn't have to be through government funds that you're investing. You, 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 you just kind of need to see that. But everything is, you know, like here we are with some, instead of having a modern Canadian Communications Act with the Canadian Communications Commission dealing with things like algorithms and artificial intelligence and and all these issues that are that are going forward, you think you're going to take the 21st century, right, which is this big. And stuff it into a little tiny yeah. box like this, which is the Broadcasting Act. It's just it it can't, you know. It it just suppresses innovation. It 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 rewards people who aren't innovating the way they they could and should. Right. Right. And and it's just really, I I I can't get over it honestly. Like there's nothing progressive about it. Well, we're having this discussion at at a at another Senate committee about intellectual property, right? We 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 pay Volkswagen and companies billions and billions of dollars to come in and create three hundred jobs. Meanwhile, we're letting them have all the intellectual property that comes with you know dealing battery construction and building with critical. Ma we're giving that away. Like we're we could we could become experts in that, right? But you're 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 really right. We've got regressive, out of date thinking on some very modern issues and modern problems and modern industries. Yeah, yeah, we do. And like, you know, I mean, like I said, I, I think there's there's legitimate, you know, issues that that yeah, can come just, from the traditional yeah. broadcasting world and that sort of stuff. But it all gets lost in this yeah. in this maze, and particularly that, you know, like. You guys in the Senate are actually pretty good. I mean, you know, though Peter Hardy <laughs> yesterday days. was way, way over the top, but but only compared, yeah. only in comparison to the really bad behavior that you know we've seen at at, at the Commons the Commons Heritage Committee. Just crazy. People, you know, come in from, I mean, you know, people like Jeff Elgie getting getting beaten up and slagged yesterday was was bad enough. But if but if, if you <laughs> If you just come, nobody would go. Let me put it this way: Everybody's asking the Senate now for amendments, in right. part because I think they were afraid to ask the Heritage Committee. Well, for the committee was a farce in the House side. That was the problem. I yeah. mean, it was, yeah, it because, was all because if you if you just if you even suggested that Pablo was Rodriguez wasn't a genius in his construction of of, of Bill C eighteen. Yeah. Um, you would be subject to, you know, being called a, a toady of Googles and that sort of stuff, yeah. and and all, you know, how much funding do you get from this? Are you being paid for that? And, you know, probably all kinds of little slight slanders, casual casual slanders and that sort of stuff. It doesn't. The problem with it is, like, some of us are old enough and have been slapped around enough in life that we can take <laughs> that. Yes. But, but, but a lot of people aren't. 
And the biggest problem is nobody listens with an open mind yeah. and sort of says, you know, that guy's got a point. And then yeah. now all the publishers show up. That. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, and then all the publishers, and that's what the process is for. And then all the publishers show up yesterday. And I, the term I was going to use for it, there seems to be a lot of sober second thought going on here. <laughs> right. Yeah. With the publishers themselves are kind of going, okay. Then they started to look at the fine print. They figured out this was not going to help. Yeah. Yeah. And that some of the people who had been saying all along, these are problems. Yeah. You know what? It, those guys might have been on to something. Yeah. Right. There are and problems. now they're looking at it and they're looking at moving forward with something they promoted, which is going to undermine trust in their industry and do them harm. And they've, and they know that. Yeah. And they're trying to get out of it now. <laughs> okay. A, a, a final quick word on on the CBC because that debate always rages, and 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 then we see the president of the CBC decide she's going to have a fight with the opposition leader, which wasn't very smart. Um, but I do think that if the CBC. Uh, benefits. They've already had the benefit of getting into the internet world totally subsidized. Uh, they use taxpayers' dollars to create their very successful uh, online presence, but to the detriment of others who tried to come in and do it on their own dime. Uh, are you, what do you think is going to happen with that? I think that's a huge mistake. Um, I think that I think that, I mean, Conrad and I have just been working on it. I just finished working on a paper on what a national news industry industrial policy should look like. Right. And right. the CBC is a big part of that. It's not a public broadcaster. We, we keep mis having, <laughs> mistaking this argument, right? right. Um, it calls itself a public broadcaster when it's convenient for it to be called a public broadcaster. But it isn't. It has a commercial broadcasting license, right? And, and it describes itself as a publicly funded commercial broadcaster. It sells advertising, it competes for eyeballs, and it gets funded by the government. The whole thing, and you heard it heard it yesterday, guys sort of saying they're our primary competitor. Crowley was before the House of Commons Committee in 2016 when they were talking about more money for the CBC, and all the publishers were saying, don't give it to them while they're taking advertising, right? These guys are killing us. You are subsidizing these guys to, you know, and they're our biggest competitors for digital ad revenue, not just, you know, for domestically and that sort of stuff. The CBC is, has really suffered, I think, from, you know, with all due respect, I think some, from, some, from some very poor leadership in recent years. Um, you don't pick fights with the opposition leader, right? right? Sure. You, you avoid that. You, you, you don't let yourself get into these sorts of situations. And again, in terms of public trust, You've now got a situation where, you know, that we have three opposition leaders in a row who won their party leadership based on defund the CBC platforms, right? True enough. <laughs> and, 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 but, you know, when the second guy won on it, somebody yeah. at the CBC should have said, oh, right, um, we need to fix something. Yeah. Right? You don't need to pander to that belief. But some, those guys are on to something somewhere, right? Yeah. And why is it and how is it and what can we do to address it and get to work on addressing it internally? Um, because now, um, I used to think that most people would actually rush to the defense of the CBC, but that's not happening. No, they're not it's, doing it anymore. No. They're not doing it anymore. They're, they're, they're not just, and it's, you know, Actually, sometimes the worst thing isn't that people have strong thoughts about you. The worst thing could be that people have no thoughts at all yeah. about you. Well, which and, is what the audience numbers indicate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the uh, um, somebody mentioned the other day that like the CBC audience in Calgary for their supper time news is like twenty thousand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's much better in Edmonton. Um, you got issues there, right? The, the, yeah. You. You, you, you're, you're obliged to serve the public in different ways. And if you're not serving them, um, then you're failing. And, and it, from my point of view, that would be too bad because there are definitely areas of the country and yep. segments of the industry that can benefit from a public broadcaster. But if you've got this 
I called it a Frankenstreamer one time. Uh, this, this this weird dualistic blend of public and and and, and commercial. It's it's bad for yeah. It's bad for the CBC, I think. And I've talked to a lot of former CBC employees yeah. who believe this too, um, as in terms of being a public broadcaster. And it's bad for the entire news ecosystem. So if C18 ends up feeding CBC more money, right? And then the second biggest recipient is Bell Media, which is not suffering at all. Nope. And and for whom news is is only part of you know their business, and they're obliged to do it. It's a transaction that they've yeah. made in terms of their Lost licensing yeah. and that sort of stuff. The world can the world might go on without them at some point, but they don't need the money. So what what's the point of that? You're just you're entrenching. Again, going back to being regressive, you're creating a structure that entrenches the world as it is today, right? And makes it really, really difficult for tomorrow to happen. Yeah. It, world it's, today it's, is this already government, it's, <laughs> Yeah, C11 or C18, it's all about serving deeply vested interests, right? They are prisoners of lobbyists, near yeah. as I can tell, and because the, the innovators, the Jeff LGs, they can, you know, they don't have lobbyists, yeah. right? Because they don't actually want anything from government. <laughs> no, and then all of a sudden, true. all of a sudden, the C11 and C18 comes up, and everybody's like, "Oh my god, oh my god, what am I going to do?" Right? Um, and and you know, some of these folks, like if you listen to News Media Canada, you'd never know that Jeff LG existed. Yeah, no, that's the thing. I, I'm, but you can't stay in denial. These are real forces and people are really using them. I mean, I subscribe to have a dozen online services because they're good content. Yep. You know, so yeah, I mean, the choice as a consumer. I mean, that's how the world is going to work. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the funny thing is, this is the, the really weird thing, but that's how the newspaper business used to work. Used to work. Exactly. That. Well, that's what that is kind of the, the point that these uh, these new forces are all subscriber based systems, as you say, which was from the beginning of time in the newspaper system. Right. Yeah. You had you had to buy a newspaper. You know, so yeah. if, I you mean, wanted. gosh, if you wanted if you wanted to find an apartment to live in or if you had one, you wanted to rent to somebody. You had to buy a newspaper. You had to buy an ad in the newspaper. You had everything went through there. It doesn't happen like that anymore. But if you have a quality, if you have information people find of value to their lives on a daily basis, they will give you a dollar a day for it. Yeah, for sure. Well, I love your no your new word, the Franken streamer. I think we're. <laughs> did you invent yeah. that? It's really, it's good. I think I did. Yeah, I'll, I'll claim good. credit for it anyway. Yeah, Somebody claim credit for now. It. Honestly, I, I steal lots of phrases from other people, but I didn't. I don't think I stole that one. No, no, that's right. Thank you so much. Uh, you two have been really uh, great today, you and Conrad, to give us, you know, a real uh, look at this. I hope you're right. I hope people come to their senses, but we never know in Ottawa whether that's possible. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, next time you talk, we'll, I'll be floating on the Indian Ocean. <laughs> yes, you. That's right. With with Conrad, we are really jealous. I know that it's great. Peter Menzies, a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute, former vice chair of the CRTC, and a and a good old newspaper man who's uh, got his feet in the ground in Calgary. Thanks so much, Peter. Always a pleasure, Senator. That's Thank you. Great. And thank all of you for joining us today. That's it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. See you soon.